IVF and women's health, what do we know and what do we need to find out? This discussion has been made possible by the Scottish Government and we at PET are extremely grateful to them for their support. And the topic that we're discussing tonight about women's health and IVF is something that we and PET and our counterparts working at Scottish Government have wanted to discuss for probably for a number of years now, actually. And there are lots of issues to tease out in relation to this. It, it's sort of the more I thought about it, the more complicated in some ways it becomes. It seems quite simple when you read the title. But I suppose we need to think about, you know, the reason why the woman is seeking the fertility treatment. Is the woman's infertility part of a bigger health issue? Does she have an underlying condition which doesn't affect her fertility but puts her health at risk if she becomes pregnant? Well, what if she has no fertility or health issues but needs to access treatment because of her partner, a problem that he may have, or perhaps she's in a same-sex relationship? Is she potentially compromising her health by using um, assisted reproduction? And of course, we can't go back. I can't not talk about the um, age because we all know that maternal age is increasing in the UK and that assisted reproduction can help women delay uh, childbirth, particularly if they're prepared to use donor eggs. And we know about the possible health implications caused to women and children by multiple births. And great work has been done to drive down the numbers of multiples. And I have to say, this has been particularly successful in Scotland, where I think they're leading the rest of the UK. So tonight's discussion will include what we know and just, important, just as importantly, we'll discuss what we need to know. What should researchers be focusing on and what does good quality research look like in this area? Um, how do we tease out the different issues here? And I suppose I want to make it clear from the outset here that we're not trying to scaremonger and make women unnecessarily anxious about IVF. We all need to keep in mind that the vast majority of women who undergo assisted reproduction are okay. Tonight we're going to hear from four experts, Professor Jenny Karunchuk, Professor Catherine nelson Piercy, Dr. Melanie Davis, and Professor Shiladatia Bhattacharya. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker this evening, Prof uh, Jenny Karunchuk. She is Professor of Perinatal Epidemiology at the University of Oxford, and she is Director of the Perinatal Epidemiology Unit. And she's also director of the NIHR, that's the National Institute for Health Research, um, Policy Research Unit in Maternal Health and Care. So the information that I'm going to present to you this evening comes from the National Confidential Inquiries, that's national is UK wide, surveillance and confidential inquiries into maternal deaths. And we carry out surveillance where we uh, calculate the rates of maternal death for any woman who dies during pregnancy or at the end of pregnancy, regardless of how that pregnancy ends, up to 42 days after the end of the pregnancy. For the confidential inquiries, which I'll tell you about, we consider those women and also women who die up to one year after her pregnancy has ended, regardless of how the pregnancy ended. So the confidential inquiries have been carried out in the UK since 1952. Um, these are now the global gold, gold standard um, and we are the leaders in the world in carrying out these inquiries and the Embrace UK collaboration, which is a collaboration of uh, various researchers from around the UK, uh, we took over the programme um, in 2012 and we produce um, an annual report. So this year we published our, uh, our most recent report uh, of maternal deaths from 2015 to 17. Uh, was published in January this year and you can see the rate at the bottom 9.7 per 100,000 maternities so that translates to about one in 10,000 women so of 10,000 women who are pregnant and giving birth uh, one of them will die during pregnancy or up to the end uh, uh, or up to 42 days after the end of her pregnancy so on the whole in the UK the UK is a generally very safe place for women uh, to give birth now, 
Um, these figures uh, come from our surveillance work, and these are the maternal mortality rates from 2003 to 18. And you can see that the maternal mortality rate, which is the overall rate at the top, has been declining uh, for many years. Um, and reached uh, uh, the lowest rate in 2013. Since then, things have uh, largely plateaued off and you can't see any evidence that really the rate uh, might be increasing, it might be plateauing, but there isn't, certainly isn't any evidence that the rate is going down. These two other figures underneath are the rates from, uh, the, the small dots are the rates from indirect maternal deaths. So those are, those are deaths um, which are from causes that are not directly due to pregnancy, but are exacerbated by pregnancy. And the direct maternal deaths where we've had the most impact um, uh, are, the, are, the, are the things that women die from that are directly due to pregnancy. And had I shown the figures uh, at this side of the graph, this is where things crossed over. So at one time, direct maternal deaths were, were the leading causes. Now this decline, and the plateauing is against uh, a change in our maternity population. So as uh, Sarah alluded to, um, there's lots of things uh, going on, not least of which the average age of our maternity population is older. Uh, there tends to be more obesity in the population. Lots of women go into pregnancy with pre-existing health problems, with all sorts of socially complex lives, uh, with different expectations about uh, their pregnancies. Uh, we have a huge amount of cultural diversity in this country. And of course, uh, we've got the issue of assisted reproductive technologies, of which IVF is one. And if we look at the um, causes of death uh, in slightly more detail than just the overall rates, um, and this, this graph shows the death, the causes of death divided into those uh, indirect causes. So these are the, 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 the dark bars. Um, and then the hatch bars are the direct causes, the direct uh, pregnancy related causes. So, for example, hemorrhage, uh, uh, dying uh, from a postpartum hemorrhage can only possibly happen after you've been pregnant, uh, whereas dying from cardiac disease, you can die from cardiac disease whether or not you're pregnant. But this is cardiac disease exacerbated by the pregnancy. So as you would expect, women um, who've conceived following IVF, are represented in, in, in these deaths, you would expect them to be represented, but they are at an increased risk of some of these causes um, and are overrepresented in some of the uh, causes of death. So thinking particularly of uh, cardiac death, and I'll illustrate that in a moment, uh, a woman who's had IVF tends to be at an increased risk of venous thromboembolism, so the development of blood clots from which, which might uh, circulate to the lungs and cause a pulmonary embolism and um, uh, women having had IVF uh, are at an increased risk of abnormal sighting of the placenta, which can lead to um, uh, hemorrhage, so bleeding uh, after, well, during pregnancy or after giving birth. So thinking about why um, women who have had IVF might be at an increased risk of some of these causes of death, um, we obviously have to think about the fact that um, women who have IVF tend to be uh, older, and there's a very clear relationship between uh, dying um, during pregnancy, maternal deaths, um, and, and age, and this is uh, very clearly illustrated in this very nice graph, um, and you can see in the, uh, the top line here uh, is uh, the rates, maternal mortality rates um, over time uh, for women who are 40 years and older. And then the next line is women who are 35 to 39 years and over, and they're all compared uh, to women at 20 to 24, which is the lowest risk of maternal death. And you can see this is illustrated here. So the proportion of women giving birth on the left, uh, only 4% of women uh, are aged um, uh, 40 and over in our population overall giving birth. Uh, but in fact, the rate uh, they represent 11% of the maternal deaths. So that's a fourfold increased risk if you are 40 years or older. Now it's a fourfold increased risk of a, of a relatively low risk, but nevertheless, there is an increased risk of dying. And if you're 30 to 39, then there's a doubling the risk. So from our data, we're not able to say uh, whether 
having an IVF per se increases your risk of maternal death or whether it's the relationship between having IVF and uh, being uh, uh, older um, uh, is, is, the, is the causal link. So going on now to talk about uh, our confidential inquiries. So this is where we um, uh, investigate each death that occurs, but we also carry out each year uh, an inquiry into um, uh, complications during pregnancy uh, where the women survive, our so-called morbidity inquiries. And we carried out one of these in 2015 to 17, uh, of women with breast cancer during pregnancy and took a random sample of women with breast cancer. Um, and of the 30 women included in that inquiry, five of them, that's 17% of them, were pregnant following IVF, which as, uh, as you will know, uh, is, is well beyond any expectation uh, due to chance. Uh, all were older women and therefore at a higher risk of breast cancer because of its known associations with age. And we'll hear a little bit more about cancer uh, from, from uh, the later talk, um, and one of them uh, at least had a breast lump which likely predated the pregnancy. Now the NICE guideline says that women should have the opportunity to make informed decisions about their care and access to treatment, uh, and in particular uh, women being offered IVF uh, should have a discussion about the additional implications of IVF and pregnancy at that age, and we highlighted uh, that um, uh, recommendation. Um, this is this is an example of uh, of one of the uh, women who um, we highlighted in our report, um, an older obese diabetic woman with a family history of cardiac disease underwent IVF. She had multiple embryo replacement. Her pregnancy was complicated by preeclampsia, and she had an extremely preterm birth. So after she'd given birth, she developed arm and hand pain, which didn't resolve. She was found collapsed the following day and couldn't be resuscitated. And when she, uh, there was a post-mortem and there was evidence of, of, of the fact that she'd had a heart attack. So although she had multiple risk factors, there was no evidence that there'd been an assessment of her medical problems or a discussion of their implications prior to her IVF pregnancy, uh, treatment. And in the period 2015 to 19, 7% of the women who died from cardiac causes had had IVF. And there was no evidence that any of them had had an assessment of their cardiovascular health prior to their IVF. And, and as we know, there's quite a lot of IVF tourism in this area. So not all the women had IVF in the UK, but even those who did uh, had not had a proper medical assessment. So we made two recommendations about this, that um, women with cardiac risk factors should have a proper cardiac assessment prior to receiving any assisted reproductive technologies or other infertility treatment. And we do need guidance on, on an appropriate medical assessment and screening prior to IVF, particularly for older women who are at high risk of cardiac disease and cancer. So pregnancy at older age is associated with significant risk for the mother and also the infant, which I haven't shown you the data for, but we have data on that in our surveillance of infant deaths. Uh, there's a twofold increased risk of maternal deaths for women 30 to 39 and a fourfold increased risk of maternal deaths for women who are 40 and over. Most women who have IVF are older. Um, comorbidities play a part in this. You need to think about prevention before treatment. And these women need to be properly medically assessed prior to IVF, especially if they're older, because they need to be informed about the risks that they may be taking when they're under, undergoing IVF. Uh, especially if they have existing medical problems. Next up, we have Professor Catherine nelson Piercy. She is a consultant obstetric physician at Guy's and St Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust and at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. She's a professor of obstetric medicine at King's College London, and she's editor of the Handbook of Obstetric Medicine. Um, so my brief is to talk about cardiovascular risks for women with IVF pregnancies. Um, and um, uh, I plan to talk about cardiac disease in pregnancy in a little bit more detail talk about the association between infertile women and cardiovascular risk. I need to talk a little bit about preeclampsia and some evidence that lifestyle interventions can work for infertile women. And lastly, although it seems incongruous, I am gonna talk about COVID vaccinations. 
Uh, so Jenny has already shown you this slide and I'm re-showing it simply to highlight that cardiac disease is the leading cause of death in pregnancy overall and the leading uh, indirect cause of death. So it's important. Um, this is a, a complicated table, table which is taken from the European Society of Cardiology guidelines for the management of cardiovascular disease in pregnancy. I don't expect you to read it, but it's simply to share with you that the, the uh, European Society have created these modified WHO classification of risk of cardiac disease in pregnancy. This is for women with pre-existing cardiac disease. And if you look down here, it gives you the actual risk of mortality and morbidity, and it describes the risk with various conditions. This is important, for example, with your patients with Turner syndrome, who can have aortic uh, dilatation, uh, a dilatation of their ascending aorta. And so, if, if you're looking after a woman with cardiac disease who, is, who attends for assisted reproduction, then you should be familiar with where her risk falls or where her individual lesion puts her at risk of morbidity or mortality in pregnancy. Uh, Jenny also shared the vignette about the woman who died of myocardial infarction, having had assisted reproductive tech techniques and IVF. And if you look at myocardial infarction in pregnancy, it is first, the first thing to say it is myocardial infarction is more common in pregnancy than outside pregnancy. And the other thing that's uh, interesting about pregnancy is, although most of the myocardial infarcts are due to atheroma, there is an overrepresentation of coronary artery dissection. Uh, you may know that pregnant women are not only predisposed to aortic dissection, they're pre predisposed to splenic artery dissection, carotid artery dissection causing stroke, and coronary artery dissection causing myocardial infarctions. So when assessing risk in your patients, the risk factors for coronary artery disease are advancing age, as Jenny has said, hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, a family history of ischemic heart disease, and obesity. For uh, intracoronary thrombosis, it's underlying thrombophilia, such as antiphospholipid syndrome. And for dissection, we don't actually know the mechanism, and it's unlikely to be uh, altered by, uh, or rather, you, you're unlikely to be able to change the risk once a woman is pregnant. And coronary artery spasm can happen to any, uh, it's more common in women than men. Um, it's uh, common with cocaine, but it can also be caused in vulnerable women by ergometrin, which is a drug used to stop, uh, to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Now this is a complicated slide, but it shows you the pregnancy risk factors for myocardial infarction. And they are age over 35, current smoking or recent smoker, and pre-existing hypertension. So this is the evidence behind that slide that I just showed you. So obviously you can't do anything about your age, but I know you all tell your patients to stop smoking prior to IVF. Um, and we need to know if they're hypertensive and whether that uh, high blood pressure is treated or not. Um, and I, I'm going to show you a paper that was published in BJOG, and this was um, what prompted them to ask me to write an editorial to go with it. And uh, if you look at um, the data that Jenny showed, if you drill down to the women with heart disease, we know that most women who die from heart disease in pregnancy are not aware that they have underlying cardiac disease. Um, so pregnancy is a, it, and IVF are, is a time when you can assess women's risk. And this was the article in the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology last year. They found, these workers found that infertile women has had a statistically significant higher body mass index, total cholesterol, a lower low uh, sorry, a higher low density lipoprotein cholesterol and higher triglycerides. All of these are viewed as cardiometabolic risk factors. In subgroup analyses, um, uh, the women with PCOS um, had a higher risk, had higher triglycerides and fasting glucose and insulin and a lower high density lipoprotein. In other words, the protective cholesterol. So I said I would talk about preeclampsia because cardiovascular risk also is related to preeclampsia risk. The risk factors for developing preeclampsia in pregnancy are older age, BMI over 30, first pregnancy, multiple pregnancy, previous preeclampsia, and a long interbirth interval. IVF, particularly using donor eggs, is a risk, as is pre-existing hypertension, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, antiphospholipid syndrome, and connective tissue disease. 
If you have preeclampsia during pregnancy, particularly if that preeclampsia means that you get delivered early and is associated with a small baby, then you have a lifetime increased risk of developing hypertension, fourfold in this study. You also have an increased risk of developing ischemic heart disease later in life, a twofold increased risk, and a twofold increased risk of developing stroke. So the risk factors for preeclampsia are the same as the risk factors for cardiometabolic disease and later um, metabolic disease. Simple interventions can highlight women at higher risk and thereby reduce morbidity and mortality and reduce morbidity and mortality after pregnancy. This is all about screening. This is the evidence that lifestyle interventions for women seeking fertility treatment can make a difference. There's a very simple Dutch study looking at the effect of a calorie restricted diet and exercise. So that it's a randomized controlled trial. They have an intervention group with, um, who are given education about diet and put on a calorie restricted diet and advised to walk more than 10,000 steps a day. So, um, and they're compared with normal controls, not um, exposed to that intervention. And I won't go through all the data because it's rather boring, but if you look at the, at the um, bottom line, lifestyle interventions in, in women seeking IVF can reduce the risk of metabolic syndrome defined as more than two of obesity, hypertension, uh, hyperglycemia, and um, high triglycerides. This was at baseline, the groups were matched. Three months, the intervention group are lower. And after six months, there's a significant reduction in the intervention group in the prevalence of metabolic syndrome. So it's difficult to lose weight and to, to do all these things, but it is possible, certainly in the context of a motivated group of women within a randomized controlled trial. So this is my message. Fertility services are in a unique position because you meet all your patients before they become pregnant. I meet them after you've made them pregnant. I can't do anything after you've made them pregnant. So this is a plea to take a thorough history, including a family history. I know you give smoking cessation advice. I know you advise them to take pre-pregnancy folic acid. Don't be despondent about asking them to reduce their BMI. Uh, I know that NICE says you they have to get their BMI below 30 and that has funding implications. That's a big motivator, but it doesn't touch um, the private sector, sadly. Um, check their blood pressure, check their urine. That will reveal diabetes and it will reveal kidney disease if they've got proteinuria. If you're concerned, check their renal function. It's a cheap blood test, certainly a lot cheaper than a thrombophilia screen. Check their fasting lipids if you're worried, uh, if they have a family history and check their blood glucose. Perform an ECG if you're worried. That's another very cheap and easy test. And if you don't, can't interpret an ECG, don't worry, ask a cardiology colleague uh, or, 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 or a medic to interpret it for you. And if, the, if you view them to be at risk, then you must refer them for proper pre-pregnancy counseling uh, before you put any embryos back and before you even collect the eggs, I would say. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to talk about COVID vaccinations because it's topical and there's a lot of misinformation about there, about the vaccine and fertility. So um, this, uh, these are the women being offered uh, COVID vaccination in pregnancy. They are those in this clinically extremely vulnerable group, including women on immunosuppression. I'm sharing this with you because many women seek fertility advice because they have fertility problems related to chronic medical disease. So you meet these women not infrequently. This is the information, the uh, frequent uh, Q&A from the RCOG, uh, freely downloadable. I hand this to all my patients in the antenatal clinic now to help them make a decision. And boy, am I so grateful to the British Fertility Society for this. I, Melanie's smiling, so I think she might have had something to do with it. But if ever there was a really punchy, effective FAQ, here it is. Can any of the COVID vaccines affect fertility? No. No, that's all you need to know. No. Uh, so they follow it up with there is absolutely no evidence and no theoretical reason that any of the vaccines can affect fertility of women or men. Full marks to the people who wrote this. I think it's totally brilliant. 
Uh, there's a whole other page about uh, embryos and freezing and if you're in the middle of IVF and you're offered the vaccine, should you delay it? Um, and as you see, there are these fantastic monosyllabic answers. Can I have COVID vaccination during my fertility treatment? Yes. Fantastic. So I'll finish there and my take home messages for, for IVF providers are, uh, you know about smoking and folic acid. You should encourage your patients to take steps to reduce their BMI. That will reduce morbidity for her, her, the woman and for her fetus. Please take a thorough history. It doesn't take 30 seconds to check a blood pressure, dip their urine. Um, and rather than checking thyroid function tests and ordering thrombophilia screens and all sorts of, I won't even mention natural killer cells, but please do these things instead of all those things uh, because they're cheap and far more effective. Refer for pre-pregnancy counselling if you're worried and counsel your women that the COVID vaccine is safe or if anything is safe, uh, but it's certainly as safe in pregnancy and doesn't cause uh, fertility problems. Thank you very much. Next this evening, we have Dr. Melanie Davis. Melanie is a consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist at the University College Hospital's Reproductive Medicine Unit and Associate Professor at UCL. She's Chair of Trustees of the EGA Hospital Trust and the Chair of the Fertility, of Fertility Preservation UK. So assisted conception is in worldwide daily practice so it's important to establish if there are any related risks of the treatment. And women going through IVF are generally young and fit, and it's very important that they have information to help them make the big decision whether to have treatment. There's long been suggestions that IVF and cancer are linked. Both are emotive subjects, of course, and they hit the headlines. But is it all scaremongering based on fear? We've seen a lot of concern about COVID vaccination recently, as Cathy has said. Is it the same with cancer? Well, firstly, let's look and see whether it's plausible that IVF could cause cancer. Several mechanisms have been suggested. We know that long-term use of HRT is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. Now, IVF causes a transient, very dramatic rise in estrogen levels, but it is very brief. Could that be enough to cause a cancer risk? We use fertility drugs as part of IVF to produce multiple eggs. Since the 1970s, there's been a theory that incessant ovulation is the reason that childless women are more prone to ovarian cancer. And thirdly, the process of IVF causes minor damage to the ovaries because they need to be punctured to harvest the eggs. Could the repair mechanism cause changes in the epithelial cells in the ovary where cancer usually arises? Now that's all theory, but is there in fact any association? I think the first thing to say is there's not a lot of good evidence. And that's mainly because, although IVF has been around 40 years, it's only really the last two decades that it's been in widespread use. And cancer, particularly in young women, is not common. So you need to look at large numbers of people and you need to follow them up because cancer is predominantly a disease of later years. So there are a lot of small studies, short follow up, and often they haven't taken into account any confounding factors like the fact of being childless or the fact that women with fertility problems don't usually smoke. And I think the reason that Sarah has asked me to speak today is that I was a co-author on the largest study that's been published in this field. And I, I really want to say I am an insignificant co-author. Um, this is a great group of people put together by Alistair Sutcliffe at UCL. And I want to give particular thanks to Carrie Williams, who's the first author on this paper and she presented for PET a month ago on childhood cancers. So this is the study design. The HFEA in Britain has mandatory reporting of all IVF cycles, and we had their records in an anonymous form over 20 years. And that came to more than 300,000 women. It was recorded what their age was, it averaged 34, 
they had fertility diagnosis. About a third um, came because of male factor, a fifth because of unexplained infertility, and 44% had female factors, which I'll come back to. We knew their number of cycles, which was 1.8 on average, and we knew whether or not they'd got pregnant. Now those records were linked with the NHS central registry. And after um, removing the women who actually lived overseas and a few thousand who had an existing cancer diagnosis, we were able to link 95% of the records, which was more than a quarter of a million women. And so that gave an enormous number of years of follow-up. Average per woman was 8.8, .8, which clearly isn't long enough. And this study needs to be rerun each decade. But we had a fair proportion followed up for more than 10 years and um, quite a few for more than 15. And this is what we found. I'm going to just talk you through this so that the numbers make sense. Looking at breast cancer, the observed cancers were 2578, 2500. And in this population, the expected number, 2641, is virtually the same. So that gives a ratio of around one, no increase in breast cancer. Corpus uteri means the body of the womb. This is endometrial cancer and not the cervix. We found 164, we were expecting 147. That does look like a slight risk, but actually it didn't reach statistical significance. So no overall increase. The issue arose here with ovarian cancer where we observed 405 cases, but we were expecting less than 300. So that did give a statistically significant increased risk of 39%. But I hasten to say that in absolute numbers, it remains small. That equates to five cases in 100,000 women over a year. Um, okay, for three, four more minutes, Sarah. Yep. So I'm going to just fill you in on some other studies and I'll try not to labor it too much. But for breast cancer, there is a plethora of literature. The older ones have all been summarized in two systematic reviews with no increased risk found. More recent literature has been a bit variable. There was a Norwegian study with positive results and there was a scare a couple of years ago with an abstract at Eshra. But there's one more big study, which was from Denmark where they looked at a population of women on the, on the national registry and compared those who used fertility drugs with those who didn't, and there was not an increased risk. So overall, the literature is very reassuring. One more small point in the orange at the bottom is that when we looked in more detail at our study, we did pick up an increased risk of in situ breast cancer, but it wasn't converted into invasive cancer. And we wondered whether this might be to do with what's called surveillance bias, meaning that these women are being intensively monitored. For uterine cancer, I'm not going to say very much more because there was nothing new in the literature. There is a trend of reducing risk with live birth. Uh, pregnancy is protective. And it's well been known that women with ovulatory disorders, in particular PCOS, run a higher risk. And our study found that. And at this point, this became a significant finding. And the management of polycystic ovarian disease by gynecologists, by GPs, is very aware of this and the need to avoid long spells without periods and excessive estrogen. But I'll just come back now to the, the final, most, most tricky area really of ovarian cancer. So just to recap, we found an increased risk overall and it applied to both invasive and borderline tumors. The risk reduced with live birth, pregnancy is protective. So all of that was known. Now, if IVF causes ovarian cancer, you'd expect the risk will be higher and higher the number of cycles you go through. And that was not the case. But the biggest clue comes at the bottom of the slide. When we looked at diagnostic groups, women who came because their partner was infertile did not have an increased risk of cancer. The risk was confined to two diagnostic groups, women with tubal disease and women with endometriosis. And probably there is some overlap in those, in those groups in the way that the, the reporting was done to the HFEA. 
Now, looking at the wider literature, um, Cochrane has looked twice at this and in 2019 updated with a total of um, 39, 37 studies altogether and huge number of women. But despite finding several positive reports, overall the literature wasn't good enough for them to say they could be conclusive. And then there's one more big study produced 2019, again in Denmark, this time they looked at all of their IVF patients and they matched them with controls and they found there was no increased risk with the exception of women with endometriosis where it was increased between three and four fold. So to summarize, <clears throat> I think here the overall message for women is reassuring. And although I don't want to overinterpret our data, I do feel that the IVF procedures appear safe and what it is is that women are bringing themselves to the IVF process and it's their preceding risk factors which probably influence the later cancer outcomes and that's why endometrial cancer is associated with anovulation and that's probably why ovarian cancer is associated with endometriosis and I think this is the most challenging message of all actually to leave you on um, because I don't think this information is widely shared the risk is raised, but it's still an unusual cancer. And so how can women be informed without being alarmist? And unfortunately, there is no screening test for ovarian cancer. It's often known as the silent killer because the symptoms are nonspecific and it presents late. All we can do is to explain the facts to women as we find them and to press on with the research to find an early marker for ovarian cancer. Thank you very much. Finally this evening, we have Professor Shiladatia Batakala. He is head of the School of Medicine, uh, Medical Sciences and Nutrition at the University of Aberdeen. And he's a consultant gynecologist at the Aberdeen Fertility Centre. I'm really grateful to all the other speakers for setting the scene. So what I'm going to do in my short presentation is to focus on the overarching uh, title of the session. So this is, to what extent is IVF responsible for problems in women's health? And we've heard a little bit about what we know. I may be going to push things a little bit further and talk about perhaps things that we do need to know. And till we get to the point where we know enough about it, what do we need to do or what options do we have? And I'm going to use a few examples to illustrate um, my points. So I think this is a fact well known to people um, that pregnancy outcomes in women following IVF or ICSI compared to pregnancy outcomes in women who conceive without any treatment, i.e. the general population, are more complicated. And if you look at maternal complications, including antepartum hemorrhage, hypertension in pregnancy, which includes preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, induction of labor, cesarean section. So things that can happen to women and interventions that occur in women are higher. And you can see what the risk ratios are. All these risks are statistically significant. This came from a meta-analysis of observational studies a while ago, but the overall message hasn't changed. So this is when you compare women who conceive with IVF to women who conceive in the general population without IVF. Those were from published studies. If we look at more local data, so this is Scottish data from the Grampian region, which is where I work. And again, if you compare outcomes in women with subfertility versus women who do present with subfertility, and we're capable of doing that because we are a rather unique center that treats everybody in the region, we can see the same signals, preeclampsia, abruption, placenta previa, induced labor, elective and emergency suggest cesarean section, are increased in women who have a history of subfertility. So that kind of corroborates what we've already seen in the literature, specifically when we look at IVF. But our own population allows us to go a step further, because when we look at the women with subfertility who clearly have higher pregnancy complications 
And we compare, albeit a smaller group of women this time, who either had a history of subfertility and conceived on their own, or those who conceived with fertility treatment, including a variety of treatments um, such as IVF, IUI, ovulation induction. This time around, if you compare the same outcomes, so preeclampsia, abruption, so that's hemorrhage and pregnancy, placenta previa, and again, things that happen to women, induction of labor, cesarean section, either elective emergency, this time around, you don't see a difference. So that kind of brings to light something that's probably been mentioned earlier this evening, that women bring some of these increased risks of complications with them, rather than these being specifically an effect of the IVF treatment. But the story doesn't end there because we now have a reasonable cohort of women who've been randomized to different forms of IVF. And this is again an example from women who've either had elective frozen embryo transfer or fresh embryo transfer. And these are in women who've been randomized to one or the other, thus taking out any bias that we find in observational studies. And if we look at preeclampsia, that's higher in women who've got frozen embryo transfers. So it's not just the predilection of women to have a certain condition. Something in the way we do different techniques in IVF could have an impact as well. So where does that leave us when we plan fertility treatment? So the first thing to realize, and I think this is quite important um, to understand, is that subfertility is not sterility. So apart from a few exceptions, so therefore to dichotomize people into fertile and infertile probably represents a cross oversimplification of the system. So therefore, the management of fertility probably needs to be more nuanced based on the chances of success with treatment, but also taking into account the additional benefit of that treatment if we are unsure about the potential risks faced by women. At the moment, we are very keen on um, prediction models that predict outcomes of IVF treatment. So this is a model that we've devised uh, based on the HFEA um, UK-wide data. And that gives us an idea of what somebody with a two-year duration of infertility, age 30, can expect if the diagnosis is male factor and the treatment is ICSI, and that's that blue line. And Equally, we can see what happens when age kicks in, and we've heard about the impact of age before in terms of complications, but it also affects the chance of conception leading to live birth. So for the same condition, the same duration, older age obviously reduces the chances of conception with multiple cycles of IVF, and a similar pattern with another cause of infertility. But this doesn't quite get to where we need to go to try and find out in order to make a balanced informed decision about embarking on IVF, what are the additional advantages in terms of conception using IVF or any other fertility treatment compared to no treatment at all? And this time it's worth pointing out that that option isn't available to everybody. It's just in a subset of couples with unexplained subfertility where there is no obvious cause found for non-conception. And this is a different kind of a prediction model. And if I take you through this over the next minute or two, if you look at scenario A, which is couple where the female partner's 30 years of age, short duration of infertility, no, over a period of time, using a model that updates itself each time we interrogate it, we find that with no treatment or expectant management, this is the chance of conception over time. So at the point of diagnosis, there's almost a 30% chance of conception leading to live birth over the next six months. This drops over time till it goes down well under 20%. Compare that to immediate access to IVF, which gives quite a um, boost in terms of chances. But again, that falls over time. And in the middle, the green line is 
superovulation and intrauterine insemination. And of course, the shaded areas are confidence intervals around it. And you can see there's a little bit of an overlap with IVF here. Contrast that to a situation where the female partner is 40 years of age with a longer duration of infertility, same overall pattern, but much lower chances of conception. And I think this is just illustrative in the fact that we can use uh, pr online predictive tools to try and get to a point where a couple can make a decision about whether the risks or potential risks of fertility treatment and IVF balance the benefits. Clearly, our observational data showing higher risks in, in women who conceive with IVF, but the story is probably a little uh, more nuanced than that because we do find that when we compare uh, pregnancy outcomes in women who conceive through fertility treatment, not with the general population, but with women who have experienced subfertility but have then conceived on their own, those dis differences disappear. At the same time, when we look at different types of IVF, and I use as an example the practice of uh, putting in frozen embryos electively as opposed to fresh embryos, we do find a clear difference in the risk of preeclampsia in women who either have one group or the other. And therefore, I think that tells us that there are areas that we need to probe more, and that's where research needs to be focused, I think, um, in the years to come. But of course, clinical decision-making cannot be paralyzed while we wait for these research findings to emerge. So at the moment, to make an informed decision about uh, the right choices, what we mustn't forget uh, is, a, is a chance of conceiving without treatment in couples who have um, unexplained infertility or a subset of infertility where there's no obvious diagnosed barrier to conception. And in this group, a personalized prognosis-based approach to me would seem to be the way forward. This is an anonymous attendee. Do we know the impact of IVF on older women 40 years plus on the menopause. Now it's a little bit ambiguous what the question is there um, as to whether it, uh, wondering whether it brings it forward or makes the symptoms more severe. I'm not quite sure. Um, but Melanie, mm. perhaps if you can try and tackle that. Well, that's commonly asked as um, will IVF use up all my eggs and will I hit the menopause afterwards? To which the answer is no, because most of your eggs are never used most of them are unfortunately just disappear and degenerate. And it's a bit like um, the iceberg, what you're seeing and what you're collecting in an IVF cycle is the tip of it. And all of those under the surface come up to fill the gap. So the answer is no, it doesn't impact on menopause. Is the simple answer. Great, I don't know that I can, I can see um... I can see Batty nodding. Um, did you want to add anything there? Perhaps just, just to say that in a way, IVF acts as a test of those perhaps whose ovaries don't respond very well to um, the hormonal treatment that we use to, to produce eggs. And, and therefore it surfaces women um, who respond poorly to IVF despite maximal stimulation and therefore might be at risk of slightly earlier menopause in some cases. Great, um, I think that's cleared that up. So, and then there is a um, another question that's sort of related really from, from Gulam Bador. Um, do you know the impact on the ovary of collecting so many eggs per cycle? Um, so perhaps for this time we'll do Batty first and then Melanie. Well, that's very kind because, in a sense, Melanie's answered that question. That's what I thought. I'm not the doctor here, so go on. So I'll, I'll reiterate the, what, what Melanie said, that it, it's a sort of the iceberg analogy, isn't it? Compared to the number of eggs that um, start off the journey and don't actually ovulate, IVF calls on relatively few. And given that most women have a finite number of IVF cycles, and to be honest, if you look at national data from the United Kingdom, it, very few women have multiple cycles of IVF. So on the whole, it's unlikely that IVF will exhaust 
the ovary of its store of eggs. Great. So the next question is from an anonymous attendee, and this one is for Jenny um, or others, um, they say. Um, and the question is, is it ethical for a clinic to offer um, refund multi-cycle payment programmes directly to patients? Um, isn't it dangerous to financially incentivise um, the clinics in this way? I think, I mean, the, the, the patients really in this way. Um, are we heading towards an American system with more multiple births and overstimulation? Um, so if you're not aware, um, Jenny, uh, that there are people can um, buy a sort of no baby, no fee almost package. Um, they can do that in the UK as well, where they can get a, um, a number of cycles um, included. Um, in that package. If they're successful first time, great. They've paid a lot for one cycle. If they don't, then they perhaps, um, and they have to have say three or four, then they, they sort of got their money's worth, if that makes sense. So I suppose the question is, is, you know, is that a responsible way to be going about to sort of tying people in to have thinking they've got to have lots and lots of IVF when it may not be in their best interests for their health? Um, I'm not really sure that I'm the right person to answer this question. I, I could express an opinion, but I think I think the IVF um, uh, doctors really would be in a better position to answer that question. I, I'm not quite sure why I was um, why it was addressed to me, but uh, Batty and Melanie, I think, would be in a better position to answer that. Okay, Melanie, you first then. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole area of ethics of payment for medical care is a difficult one for for me. Um, I perhaps answer the last part of it. No, we're not heading to the American pattern of more multiple births and overstimulation. In Britain, there has been enormous amount of work over the last 10 years bringing down the multiple pregnancy rate um, with nice guidance, with peer pressure, with reporting to the HFEA, and now with the reporting of birth rate per embryo transferred, that really is transformative because it takes the pressure off the clinics trying to push their success rates up by multiple embryo transfers. Um, so I think we're heading in the right direction here. And I'll leave the financial side to Batty. And I'm happy to jump in that. I think if we throw our minds back to the NICE recommendations and if we think about current Scottish government funding for IVF, that's for three cycles. And that's for a very good reason based on cost effectiveness work that was done within the NICE guideline development group. Um, I think I showed one slide that uh, looked at predicted outcomes in terms of live birth in different groups of women over time, which showed very clearly that a, tr a whole treatment of IVF should comprise a fresh uh, embryo transfer, given that we are uh, down to a position of uh, almost um, zero tolerance towards mul multiple births, where we want to bring down the risks to the woman. And therefore, frozen embryos that are surplus um, can be stored and replaced later. So that's a complete cycle. If we take that as one unit of treatment, I think three cycles involves three full attempts at that to give women a reasonable chance of conception. So I'm not sure that that ties in with uh, a statement that that opens the door to increase risks for the woman over and beyond what any treatment carries in terms of, uh, of risks, because ultimately it's about responsible treatment that brings down the multiple pregnancy rate. And it's about the responsibility that goes with caring for a woman that limits her exposure to other risks around IVF treatment. Sorry, I usually had to mute myself because my neighbour's children being very noisy next door. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so the next question that we have is from James Duffy, um, who says, fantastic presentation. I think that was actually, that's aimed at Cathy, I think. Um, so well done. Um, should there be any more emphasis on maternal medicine during reproductive med medicine training? And should IVF clinics have an embedded maternal medicine team? So that's a really good question James and thank you for it obviously I have a vested interest I would I would want everyone to be in obstetrics and gynecology to be um, to have maternal medicine training I think um, I want to make two comments um, 
Yes, but they, they've got a lot to get through in their in, in their training. But what, what IVF doctors need to know is what they don't know and, and when to refer to somebody who may know. Uh, I think it's unrealistic to, uh, to expect um, IVF doctors to have the same knowledge of maternal medicine as a maternal medicine obstetrician, and they haven't got time in their training. But um, it, it's, the, it's the emphasis on pre-pregnancy counselling and who should do that so if I answer the second part of the question first they don't have to have an embedded maternal medicine team but they have to work with a team that they can refer to who will be able to answer the question and counsel the woman about her risks of either going through IVF and or carrying a pregnancy herself that's the important thing so the woman can make an informed decision that doesn't have to be by the IVF specialists themselves uh, so it's it's no, it's phoning a friend having a colleague and um, I hate to come back to the private sector that, that Melanie mentioned, but, but the problem there is, is exacerbated because they are less likely to refer as people do in the NHS. In my experience, NHS IVF clinics are very good at um, referring to, to specialists, either that woman's own physician specialist, if she has a pre-existing problem, or to an obstetric physician. And that, that is getting better. It's another, uh, uh, you know, something that's changing for the better within ART, but it doesn't happen in the private sector. Jenny, is there anything that you wanted to add there? Because I, I could see you smiling. I'm guessing that you were in favour of this. You, you sort of quite liked this question that there should be this uh, more of an emphasis on maternal medicine. Um, in... uh, the, um, only in as much as I would you know, fully concur with uh, with Cathy that um, actually it's about appropriate referral. It's about appropriate uh, assessment of women when they come to to think about what their medical uh, what medical comorbidities they might bring with them and to assess those properly and and to refer. Um, uh, so that, that, that's the clear message from um, from Cathy and also from our reports. Thank you. So we have a couple of different questions about the vaccine. Um, and as Cathy mentioned, the vaccine, we'll put them to her first. But I know this is something that everybody's very interested in. So um, I'll let the rest of you chip in. So the first question is someone who's undergoing IVF right now and is a medic. Um, and she's found that she was unable to have the vaccine during treatment um during the risk of the because of the risk of the vaccine causing side effects which would mean i was unable to attend the clinic um how would you advise clinics from this point of view so um there's two things here it is the woman's decision not the clinic's decision whether the woman receives the vaccine or not that's the first thing to say um but if you get a fever or symptoms after the vaccine then there is concern that by going to the ivf clinic you're then spreading covid um, I've had both doses of my vaccine, as I'm sure have, have many of the people listening, and the first dose with the AstraZeneca, the second dose with the Pfizer gives you side effects. I got rigors after my second dose. Um, that, but we know the more people that are getting vaccinated, the more we know about the side effects. Um, I, I'm not sure whether, whether the IVF clinic advised her against the vaccine or whether she didn't want to take it in case it caused side effects that would mean that she couldn't attend her appointments. Actually, fever after the vaccine is, is quite unusual. It's a sore arm is virtually universal, a bit of myalgia uh, and some rigors. So I think you have to be sensible. It's, it's fine to, to delay it a few weeks so as not to coincide with a visit, but those side effects only last 24 hours, 48 hours maximum, whereas COVID lasts longer. So I'm waffling a bit, but I hope that answers the question. Or that bit of the question. Melanie and uh, Batty, I don't know whether you wanted to come in here about your, you know, your own ex experience in the clinic. I completely agree. I concurred with everything that Cathy said about COVID vaccination. And um, I can appreciate that women might be wise not to have it the day before their egg harvest in case they feel unwell on the day of the procedure. But why not have it at the start of stimulation, done and dusted? There's no reason not to have it as part of your treatment. Okay, great. Batty, I can see you're poised to speak. Yeah, I, I'm just going to agree with that and not drag this out any further. There's a very clear message. That... Great. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just chip in and I say there's no reason to not have it, but there's every reason to have it. And that's that you don't want to get COVID. 
if you get COVID, then you know that um, that that really will affect your treatment um, and and potential future. So. Um, and there's an, another question relating to the vaccine from um, Minna Cooper Coles. Um, I am pregnant and I wasn't allowed the vaccine. They refused to give it me, she says. Um, now, obviously, we don't know her medical details as to why that might be, um, but it seems to conflict with what you've been saying. I mean, during pregnancy, what is the advice with the vaccine? Yeah, well, I think I hope things are changing, but we weren't helped in this country by the original message saying don't give it in pregnancy, don't give it breastfeeding. And if you have it, don't get pregnant for two months. That was not helpful. So we're backpedaling. And understandably, women, they get two messages and then they're expected to believe the, the last one. So I completely understand the, the fear, the confusion, the uncertainty. But uh, I think we now have come out with the correct advice and it is the woman's decision not the doctors or the vaccinator or the prescriber um, and it's it's not it's absolutely not the IVF clinic's decision it, most of these women are being vaccinated in the community now and if she's had an alert from her GP because she falls into an at-risk group then she's had that alert for a very good reason and then all she has to decide is when to have it so I'm rather alarmed at, at, at the you know an IVF unit refusing her the vaccine it's not up to them to give the vaccine it's not up to them to decide whether she has it. it's up to the woman herself Oops. do you mind if i come in kathy because there might be an, another interpretation as well here that at the moment in the uk the vaccine rollout is based on a stratification of risk and so if one gets a call for a vaccine you should definitely have it but if they haven't got to you yet because they're considering you a low risk person, you can't ask the antenatal clinic or ask your GP to give it to you in advance, unfortunately. But, well, not unfortunately, because if too many people jump the gun, then there isn't enough left for everyone else. Yeah, yeah, I, I, agree. I agree. There are many, many interpretations. and We don't actually know what happens. And let's be honest, the texting system is is not perfect and there are mm. women that should have received texts that haven't and those that have who you think well why was she offered a vaccine and uh, you know you, you everyone listening will know that there is massive geographical variation you know it depends where you live as to how quickly they're going down the list mm. uh, so there is uh, but but you know it's it's pretty good I don't know what the figure is 25 million now it's pretty impressive mm. um, and hopefully the more people that get va vaccinated the less the, the, the fear will go down, it will be more commonplace. And we're all gonna have to be vaccinated again next year anyway. So we better get used to it. And, you know, delaying a vaccine because you're planning a pregnancy or having fertility treatment, or you are pregnant or you are breastfeeding, you know, that's, that's a long time. And as Jenny says, and we know from the, from the UCOS data, how devastating COVID can be in pregnancy. It can kill you, full stop. So, uh, you know, 24 hours of side effects. Uh, and as you say, Melanie, timing the vaccine to your fertility treatment is a, is a much more sensible approach rather than just saying, oh, you know, it, it might do something terrible. I won't have it. Great. Thank, thanks for that, Kathy, and for being so forthright. Um, so the next question, complete change of tack. Um, this is from Catherine Snell, and this is more of a, a general lifestyle thing. Is there, is there any, diff, any evidence that a particular diet pre-IVF and during IVF can increase your chances of success? I think, you know, often people are um, really want to try and take control of some element of their treatment and diet is something obviously that you can do at home. Um, so is there any evidence that doing something like that will make a difference? So if we go to Melanie and Batty for that one, please. Mm. Simple answer, no particular diet um, will increase your chance of success, but it's got to be a good diet. You know, the Coke and chips obviously is not going to be a great lifestyle to, to have in the background. The only national recommendations are about folic acid and vitamin D. Um, but there's, there's no point spending a lot of money and seeing a nutritionist and getting any kind of fad diet in preparation for IVF, just a normal, healthy, balanced diet. And we'll come to losing weight, I think, with some of the other questions. But if you're of normal weight, have a normal, good diet. Batty, do you concur with that? 
I agree with that, and I'm almost going to take it a step further in terms of the next logical question. If people are overweight, um, does weight loss increase their chances of conception leading to a healthy baby? And the expectation is that um, that's going to be the case. You would certainly encourage people to lose weight if they are overweight or obese. Um, however, if we look at the data from uh, the, the a very specific large randomized trial that was done in the Netherlands that doesn't seem to show that actually following interventions to lose weight for people who are undergoing fertility treatment gives them a huge advantage in terms of having a, a healthy baby born um, without complications. So no one's going to advise people not to be healthy, but the data around that are less strong than we would like to be. So I'm going to add it to my list of things that we want to know more about. Yeah, so I suppose, you know, that obviously the, the healthy BMI message really came out quite strongly from Jenny and Kathy in their presentations about some of the, some of the um, cardiovascular risk. And Jenny wants to come in now. Um, so I'll pass over. Sorry, Kathy wants to come in. Okay. Kathy. Sorry, no, I just I can't I can't resist just just ramming home the message um, that it, it might not increase your chances of conceiving. But if you get pregnant and, uh, you know, the difference is not so much a BMI 31 to 29, which is the motivation to get the IVF. Um, but 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 it's more uh, significant weight loss if, if you're with a BMI, BMI above 35, because you will reduce the risk of miscarriage, preeclampsia, a small baby, diabetes, venous thromboembolism, uh, postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, we, know, we have the data from, from, from UCOS and from Embrace that, that obesity is a potent risk factor for pregnancy morbidity. I am in no way saying that it's easy. It's very difficult. And I think there's a comment or a question about dietary advice and, and, and exercise. You know, how do you, do you lose weight? You need diet and exercise together. And that does work. And I think uh, Melanie or Batty will correct me or Jenny that, that I think it's Weight Watchers that's that's done a, um, a randomized controlled trial proving that that you can lose weight if you join Weight Watchers. So we're also the other thing to say and, and then I'll let the others speak is that you are catching in a public health message you're catching women at a very vulnerable but motivated time in their life if they're going to lose weight this is when they're going to do it it's the same as stopping smoking. And that has massive implications for their long-term health. So if I, if I could come in for on two grounds, so just to, to agree with you there totally, and I think you're absolutely right. There was a trial from Birmingham that showed that uh, the Weight Watchers vouchers uh, did help people lose weight. And just want to clarify the point I was trying to make, isn't that losing weight is not a good idea. It is that the trial found that their intervention, which was a package, didn't actually work particularly well, which is something I think that we are all familiar with because compliance rates tend to lapse over time. So I think it's absolutely important that people lose weight, but what we are still wanting to find out is an effective way of doing that that people can comply with and maintain over time. Great, and I think everyone's struggling um, thinking about their weight with lockdown, if there's a particularly in that, it's, it's more of a challenge to be active, um, shall we say, or is that just me oversharing? Um, so the next question um, is from Minna Cooper Coles again, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, um, and she wants to know about bowel cancer and IVF. Um, is there any research being done on whether there's a link there? Because she had bowel cancer, so I'm very sorry to hear that, and she knows two other women who got it during pregnancy after IVF. Um, so, um, Melanie, I don't know whether you've looked at this issue at all. Gosh, Minna, I'm, I'm really sorry um, to hear that. I didn't mention bowel cancer because there's only so much you can fit into 10 minutes, so I concentrated on reproductive cancers. There are some studies, and actually they haven't shown an increased risk of bowel cancer linked to IVF, although there's a bigger literature that's outside my expertise about hormonal influences on bowel cancer, um, but it's not been directly linked to IVF. 
and I don't think anyone wants to come on, so I'll plow on with another question. We're just going to try and get a couple more in before we have to finish. Um, so there's a question from someone who's anonymous. What about hyperstimulation? Are there long term health um, consequences um, as a result of ovarian hyperstimulation? So we'll go to um, Batty and then to Melanie. OK, thank you. So I, I think the straight answer to that is hy ovarian hyperstimulation can be of varying degrees of uh, severity. And the extremely severe cases of ovarian hyperstimulation uh, situations where people are in intensive care can result in a number of um, uh, long term complications. And I think, you know, um, we are not going to enumerate all of them. At the other end of the spectrum and somewhere in the middle of the spectrum is a controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, which is something that um, we, we aim to achieve in order to get more than the physiological number of one egg from the ovary. So anything we do is a, a degree of hyperstimulation. And I think Melanie has addressed the question around whether that poses lasting damage to the ovary. So I think in, in summary, um, very severe ovarian hyperstimulation could, but normal levels of ovarian hyperstimulation have not been shown to cause any, any lasting damage, but I can hand over to Melanie. The only thing um, to add really is that ovarian hyperstimulation is almost universally associated with having underlying polycystic ovaries. And if you have polycystic ovary syndrome, then there are associations with long-term health outcomes, in particular metabolic risks and cardiovascular disease. So it, it's a bit like getting gestational diabetes. In a way, I would see it almost as a bit of a wake-up call to think about possible um, possible issues down the road. Great, thanks for that. And I think now the final question, um, and I'll put this to Jenny first, um, and that is, have the data been segregated for ethnicity and race with relation to maternal health outcomes and links to pregnancy and fertility treatment? Um, so we, um, because we deal with women who die, maternal deaths, there are fortunately relatively few of those. So our capacity to do any um, uh, segregated analysis, to do any uh, uh, analysis of uh, any other factors is extremely limited by that fact. So no, we haven't done that, um, not in relation to maternal deaths. And does anybody else want to come in there with their, about on that? Issue. Sorry, I should have said maternal deaths and IVF. Yeah, we, we do we do look at other factors overall. Data on ethnicity is now being collected, so we can look at morbidity. And you know, you you're all aware of the the, the huge increased risk that Black, Asian, minority ethnic women suffer with COVID. That's um, you know been very well publicised. Um, we're not sure of the reasons why, but. Um, but certainly for, for reasons that are very complex, as Jenny says, we, we do know that black women are overrepresented in the, in the uh, maternal mortality uh, statistics. Um, uh, so my closing thought is that you need to think about the, the woman holistically, think about all her uh, medical, the medical issues and the other factors that she brings with her as she comes to the fertility clinic and to make sure that she's uh, properly assessed and referred on when abnormalities are found. Otherwise women will die.